Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. My name is Salim al Mariati, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Welcome to our continued series, uh, lecture series uh, on the Palestinian issue, uh, A New Approach. Uh, with us today, I'm very, very honored to have uh, Ken Roth, who is the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch. Ken is, the, uh, is one of the world's leading international human rights uh, organizations leaders, uh, which and Human Rights Watch operates in more than 90 countries. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch in 1987, Ken served as a federal prosecutor in New York and for the Iran-Contra investigation in Washington, D.C. A graduate of Yale Law School and Brown University, Ken has conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world. He has written extensively on a wide range of human rights abuses, devoting special attention to issues of international justice, counterterrorism, the foreign policies of the major powers. Ken, we, uh, we're very honored to have you and looking forward to hearing your remarks. Okay. Um, well, Salam, um, thank you so much for, for hosting this event and for agreeing to have me. It's, it's my pleasure to be able to speak with you on this very important topic. And what I thought I would do is just, you know, uh, briefly introduce um, the report that Human Rights Watch recently issued, but a bit of the rationale behind the report as well, and some of the reaction to it, you know, how we feel that it has gone since the publication of the report. But let me begin with the beginning. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch has obviously been reporting on Israel and Palestine for, you know, 30 years, um, probably more. And we traditionally did this the way everybody else did. We, um, you know, because there is an occupation in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. We treated the you know, Israeli conduct under the rules of what are known as you know, international humanitarian law or the laws of war. And these, um, you know, among other things, prohibit the settlements. They, they prohibit you know, transferring the occupying powers population into the occupied territories, which is what the settlements are all about. Um, and make those war crimes, pure and simple. You know, so we would analyze that, we would look at the various ramifications of the settlements, we would obviously look at um, the periodic bombing of Gaza, um, the, the use of excessive police powers, force, you know, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem and elsewhere. Um, and we would sort of do this, you know, issue by issue, mostly under humanitarian law. Now, we became dissatisfied with that approach. Um, it, it's still valid. Humanitarian law is still an appropriate way to look at the occupation. But as the occupation went on and on and on, and there was no end in sight, we began to realize that we needed to analyze the situation under the law that is really, you know, more for a more normal situation, a situation that's not changing. And so we began to supplement our use of international humanitarian law with international human rights law which is to deal with you know, more, more normal situations of governance. Um, not to replace humanitarian law, but to supplement. And we began doing that initially by documenting discrimination, you know, by looking at how you know, the settlers on the hill were treated very differently from the Palestinian village down the way in Area C of the West Bank. And, and so we did a series of reports on that, but we finally decided to take a, a bigger, more holistic view and say, you know, here we have a situation of systematic discrimination, you know, oppressive rule. Let's look at this under the full panoply of human rights laws. And so in particular, um, we decided to look at um, the crimes, really the crimes against humanity of persecution and apartheid. And, you know, the result of that inquiry was a 213 page report a threshold crossed, which um, Human Rights Watch issued a, a few months ago. Now, um, you know, let me just sort of state by way of preface that Human Rights Watch was not the first organization to find that the crime of apartheid was being committed. Um, our colleague organizations, Israeli groups like B'Tselem and Yashdin have both done that within the last year. Um, and, and a number of Palestinian groups have done it earlier than that. So we don't pretend to be the first ones to do this, but I think probably it's safe to say that our report is, is the most comprehensive. Um, you know, second, we are hardly the first ones to use the term apartheid. 
uh, if you kind of you know pay attention to the media, increasingly, you know, major publications like the New York Times and the Economist would use kind of apartheid in the conditional sense. You know, if Israel continues down this road, it will become apartheid. You know, it was always something you know safely off in the future. Um, and what we found at the end of our study is it's here. You know, this is no longer conditional future tense. This is, you know, reality. Now, let me just say a bit more about the methodology. Um, you know, although the term apartheid clearly originated in South Africa, this is not meant to be an historical analogy. Um, we are not engaged in a history contest here. We were applying international law. And in particular, there are two treaties that codify the crime of apartheid. There is the Apartheid Convention, appropriately named, of 1973. And then there is the Rome Statute that created the International Criminal Court in 1998. And in essence, what these do is define three elements of the crime. You have to have an intent by one racial group to dominate another, combined with systematic oppression and then certain inhumane acts carried out pursuant to that oppression. Those are the three elements, you know, intent to dominate, systematic oppression, inhumane acts. Now, the, the crime of persecution also is stated in the Rome Statute, and that's pretty similar. It, it talks about the need to have um, intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights because of group identity with discriminatory intent. So, you know, slightly different wording, slightly different requirements, but, but quite similar in terms of what we need to find. Um, I should note that, um, you know, although apartheid is written in terms of race and racial domination, that race these days is understood as far more than skin color, far more than just genetic attributes. It also includes ethnicity and nationality. Um, indeed, if you look at the race convention, it defines race explicitly in those terms. So there's no question that the term race in these broader terms does apply to the Israeli-Palestinian situation. So that's, um, that's by way of background. Now, the conclusion of the report, we found that um, there is indeed an intent on the part of the Israeli government to maintain dominance of Jewish Israelis over Palestinians across all areas that are under Israeli control. Um, so this is you know, a kind of a river to the sea intent, but it is coupled with systematic oppression and inhumane acts that we found only in the occupied territories. And because it's not apartheid until these three elements of the crime come together, we found that these elements of the crime came together in the occupied territories. Now, let me say a, a bit about um, the different elements. In terms of the intent, we found that it was manifested by a whole variety of official statements, along with very deliberate efforts to manipulate demography and access to land. The demography was really aimed at ensuring a Jewish majority, um, certainly in the areas that the Israeli government cares the most about. So, you know, certainly within the 1967 borders, but also within the parts of the West Bank that the Israeli government covets as ultimately being part of Israel proper. Um, so there's a tendency to pack Palestinians into smaller and smaller areas. You know, Gaza is sort of a separate thing. The Israeli government doesn't want Gaza. So they're perfectly happy for Palestinians to be walled off there. But then if you look at within, you know, Green Line Israel, um, there's a tendency to, you know, kind of constrain Palestinian villages, um, keep the Palestinian population you know, smaller, not covering very much area. And similarly, um, within the West Bank, where, you know, particularly in Area C, um, the settlements are flourishing, but the um, Palestinian villages are seriously constrained, often not even allowed to build an extra bedroom, let alone, you know, build anything more substantial. So there is this intent, which is quite clear across the board. In terms of the requirement of oppression and inhumane acts, let me start off by you know, describing what's going on within Israel proper, within Green Line Israel, because there 
we did find systematic discrimination, but we did not feel that it rose to the level of oppression, the type required to, to find a violation of, of persecution or apartheid. And so just to give you an example of the discrimination, a lot of people don't know this, but there are 900 communities within Israel which have so-called admission committees. The effect of which is to say that nobody can move in until this committee decides that they are compatible with everybody else in that community. And essentially they're used to keep out Palestinians, to say, oh, a Palestinian here wouldn't be compatible with this community. No, they can't come in. So it's you know, blatant discrimination. And you see things like that you know, across the board within Greenline Israel. But because nonetheless, Palestinians within Israel are citizens of Israel, they have the right to vote, they have the right to travel, they have representation in the Knesset, um, they you know, an hour even have a party that's a member of the governing coalition, we didn't feel that we could go so far as to say it was oppression. Um, on the other hand, within the occupied territories, we felt that there was um, overwhelming evidence of oppression and inhumane acts. Um, so for example, there are two completely different legal systems governing in the occupied territories. If you are a settler, you are governed by the same civil law as in Israel proper. If you're a Palestinian, you're governed by military law. Um, there is radically different access to land and resources. So, um, you know, if you look at sort of the expro expropriation of land by the Israeli government, um, about a third of the West Bank um, is, is now taken, 99% of which goes to settlers. Hardly any of it goes to Palestinians. Uh, the settlements, you know, as I mentioned, are booming. You know, they're, they're growing, they're flourishing. Um, but a Palestinian village right next door, you know, the village whose farmland may have been seized to build the settlement, are not allowed to even do natural growth. You know, they, they need a, a permit to add anything, you know, a school, a community center, um, a bedroom. And um, these permits are very hard to come by. And if a Palestinian in Area C builds without a permit, the structure gets demolished. And so there's a very blatant discriminatory effort to constrain Palestinians and really to make life as difficult as possible within Area C, you know, with the hope that Palestinians will just go off to Area A or B you know, and kind of leave Area C for the settlements and ultimately for annexation. Um, there are, you know, huge differences in the ability to travel. If you are an Israeli Jew living in the settlements, you've got special roads, you zip in and out, you basically don't even know where the green line is. Um, you're, you're part of Israel, you know, you're, you're fine. Um, if you're a Palestinian, you get checkpoints, you can't go on the, the better roads, which are deemed settler roads. Um, you are, you know, very constrained. You, you, you know, can't travel back and forth between Gaza and the West Bank. Even your ability to leave the country is, is to leave the West Bank is, is controlled by Israel. Um, there are huge differences in the ability to reunify your family. You know, if you have um, an, an Israeli who has a family member abroad, who marries somebody abroad, can bring them in quite easily, get permanent residency, very frequently citizenship. For a Palestinian, that, that's not the case. It's extraordinarily difficult for a Palestinian to bring a spouse, say, um, into territory controlled by Israel. Um, and of course, there are vast differences in terms of personal freedoms, where you know, Israelis have free speech, free association. Um, they can, you know, they, they live under a system that is largely respectful of their, their political freedoms. Palestinians have huge constraints imposed on them. And I should say constraints imposed not only by the Israeli government, but also by Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. But if you look even you know, at sort of the role that the Israeli government plays, um, it is once more blatant discrimination between the Israeli and the Palestinian populations. And so you know, what this added up to for us was the kind of systematic oppression, the inhumane acts that are um, meet the requirement for the element of the crime of you know, both apartheid and persecution. Now, with that finding, we made a number of recommendations. Um, we urged the International Criminal Court, which has formally launched an investigation into Palestine where it has jurisdiction because Palestine is a recognized member of the UN, so therefore was able to join the ICC and confer jurisdiction over any crime committed on Palestinian territory. So when Israel complains, you know, why are you going after us? We didn't sign up for the ICC. 
Nobody's going after crimes committed within Israel. But if an Israeli commits a crime within Palestine, they're subject to ICC jurisdiction. I mean, it's as if I, an American, you know, would go to London and say, how can you prosecute me for murder? I'm an American, you know? Um, no, if you commit a crime in somebody else's territory, you're subject to their jurisdiction. Same applies for Israelis who commit a crime within Palestinian territory. Um, we also urge um, the UN to create a special rapporteur to really look at um, the crime of apartheid across the board, not just in the occupied territories, but really around the world, because there are other circumstances where, where comparable situations are arising. We ask governments to call it out, to call it what it is, to condition military support on its end. Um, we ask you know, businesses to avoid complicity in, in this serious crime, you know, much as we've asked them to avoid complicity in, in the illegal settlements. But you know, perhaps most important, um, and I think this was in many ways our main goal, is we wanted to shift the paradigm. We wanted people to stop thinking about the occupied territories just as an occupation. Because this is an occupation that is, you know, certainly these days looking permanent. It's not going any place fast. And so you've got to look at how are people treated now? You know, yes, there might be some future, but now how are they treated? And they are treated with this blatant discrimination, this, you know, apartheid. And so we want that characterization to be understood because you, you know, naming it, understanding it is the first step toward changing it. And we've been very heartened, you know, the, the media, um, is using the term apartheid much, much more. It's as if you know, these series of reports have now legitimized the term. Um, we see a number of governments using the term, most pr pronouncedly France, where French Foreign Minister Le Trion used the term, said that this is not something about just the future, this is about the status quo. So there's been a real shift in important governments and certain important media um, recognizing this sad reality. Now, let me say a word about the Israeli government response. Um, despite the 213 pages, they were not able to come up with a single fact that we got wrong. They were not able to come up with a single element of the analysis that we got wrong. And instead, they basically either misrepresented the report and then attacked the misrepresentation, or they tried to change the subject. And let me give you just a few examples of that. Um, you know, for example, they, they, you know, they started off with name calling, you know, we're biased, we're anti-Semitic, but, you know, what we did here, which is, you know, just apply international human rights law, um, is the same thing we do in, you know, 100 countries around the world. Um, you know, we report not only on Israeli abuses, but also on Palestinian Authority abuses, on Hamas abuses, on Hezbollah abuses. You know, it's impossible to say that we're biased. We, we do this, apply the same standards to everybody. Israel just doesn't like it when we apply the standards to them. You know, now they all often say, how can you say we're like South Africa? South Africa was so different. But of course, if they read the report, they would see we're not saying they're like South Africa. We're not making a historical analogy, as I said at the outset. Um, we're just applying the international law of apartheid. Um, they say, well, how can you say that it's apartheid? Palestinians are citizens. But of course, if they read the report, they would realize that we don't claim it's apartheid within Green Line Israel where the Palestinians are citizens, but we do say that the elements of the crime come together in the occupied territories where Palestinians are not citizens. So again, they're, you know, they're rebutting something that is just not what the report says. Um, they say, you know, oh, if only we had a partner in peace, this would all go away. You know, we just need the peace process to be revived. Now, you know, we've heard this for now, what is it, 33 years or something like that? You know, so, um, you know, great, we all hope the peace process goes someplace, but you know, you'd have to be out of your mind to be holding your breath over that one. And our view is you can't cite the peace process, you know, stymied as it is, as a justification for an intolerable status quo. It's time to look at the status quo. And if at some point in the future, there's a revived peace process, great. But in the meantime, let's stop the apartheid. You know, let's treat people equally, give them their equal rights. Now, you know, one Israeli government response was to say, oh, but what about our security? There's terrorism, you know? And of course, if they read the report, they would realize that we completely explicitly recognize the security problems that Israel has. But the practices that we describe are either not about security at all or are completely overbroad in addressing security. So to give you some examples, um, you know, things that have nothing to do with security are, for example, the settlements. 
you know, the settlements, if anything, make security worse because the Israeli army's got to defend all the settlements. You know, that has nothing to do with security. That has to do with seizing land. Um, the, the home demolitions, you know, the lack of building permits, that has nothing to do with security. That's a matter of just stymieing ordinary Palestinian life. Um, the, you know, discriminatory access to resources like water, um, the, the bars on family reunification. You know, these are all about just, you know, privileging Israeli Jews over Palestinians. And even things that, you know, would have a, you know, a security dimension to it, say, for example, um, travel. You know, of course, Israel has a right to, you know, make sure that a terrorist doesn't come into to Israel, but that doesn't mean barring travel for the entire millions of Palestinians. You know, that's not an, a tailored response to a security threat. So in essence, you know, security is not an answer to the apartheid finding. Now, um, the Israeli government says, but you're, you know, you're attacking Israel as a Jewish state. And now, of course, there are questions about, you know, is Israel a Jewish state when it's 20% Palestinian? But I'll, I'll leave that aside for the moment. But, but um, we don't challenge the fact that um, every state is entitled to select immigration, to restrict immigration. So if Israel wants to, you know, give preference, preferential immigration access to Jews, that's something they are empowered to do. But that does not entitle them to, for example, discriminate among the citizens of Israel, to say that, you know, if you're a Jew, you get to bring in your spouse. If you're a Palestinian, you don't. You know, certainly if a Palestinian spouse is from the occupied territory. So it's that kind of discrimination that we object to, um, not the, the, you know, the self-declared self um, Jewish state. And the final, you know, point that they make is to say, this is BDS. You know, you're calling it apartheid just because you want to boycott Israel. But of course, you know, Human Rights Watch has never urged a boycott of Israel. You know, we, we uphold the right of people to advocate BDS, but we actually have not joined the BDS movement. Um, you know, the closest we've come to anything is to say, you know, businesses avoid complicity in the war crime settlements. You know, don't do business in those settlements. You know, what Ben and Jerry's just did, that was good. That was, you know, living up to their business responsibilities. But we don't call for consumer boycotts. We don't call for any boycott of, of Israel. So this has nothing to do with BDS. That's an effort just to kind of use labels to avoid addressing the reality. So, you know, what we come up with is that, you know, the Israeli government has no answer to this report. Um, they have name calling, they have changed the subject arguments, they have misrepresentations, but they've done nothing to defeat the, the very detailed findings. And that, you know, what these findings should compel us to do is to dismantle the apartheid, to aim for um, equal rights. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, one state, two state, confederation. Human Rights Watch actually doesn't take a position on any of that. Our view is whatever you have, you need to have equal rights, that you can't allow this regime of blatant discrimination, of blatant oppression to go on forever in the name of this moribund peace process. You got to look at the reality now. The reality is apartheid, and the antidote to apartheid is equal rights. So let me stop there, and, and Solomon, welcome a conversation with you. Thank you, Ken. That was the most lucid presentation I've ever uh, been witness to, and I learned so much. And uh, as I've been telling other speakers, just to, and to you especially, I, I feel like I need to pay tuition now uh, for uh, for learning so much uh, about international law, human rights law um, from your from your discussion, and and also um, how, um, for lack of a better term, I can't think of the right term, but it's. It's it's so objective. It's it's balanced. You're not you are looking for facts and then determining the position. You're not taking a position and then trying to find facts uh, exactly. to substantiate the position. And that's the sign. Um, I mean, it's just a sign of integrity. And I really really appreciate. Which is also why our findings are slightly different from other groups. You know, we yes. But, you know, fair enough. That's okay. You know, and you know, in in one of our sessions uh, on international law. I, even from the Palestinian side, I, I believe that, uh, or what we've, what we've uh, uh, concluded is that Palestinians need to accept the facts wherever they fall, wherever 
the, the consequences uh, uh, of investigations on war crimes, uh, we need to accept those uh, no matter what the consequences are. If it's a Palestinian or an Israeli or a third party that is aiding and abetting these crimes against humanity, there needs to be justice. Uh, and, and that stand for justice, I think, is what is testing all of us, no matter which side you're on, uh, on this issue. Um, but I wanted to just go back to the beginning, if you could just explain the distinction between humanitarian law and international law. I think that's important. So was, yeah. no, the distinction is between international human rights law right. and international humanitarian law. And I apologize for all these legalese things, but it's important. Um, Thank you. But um, human rights law basically governs, you know, how governments treat their people in ordinary times, and it includes, you know, the full range of civil and political rights on the one hand, economic, social, and cultural rights on the other hand. But when there is a war, when there is an armed conflict, international humanitarian law or the laws of war kick in, and they're basically the Geneva Conventions and you know various treaties like that. Um, the, you know, obviously there's not a day-to-day -day state of war between Israel and Palestine, but there is an occupation. And the fourth Geneva Convention, you know, one element of international humanitarian law sets forth the rules of occupation. Um, and that, for example, Article 49 of the fourth Geneva Convention says you cannot transfer the occupier's population into the occupied territory. And the idea is, you know, okay, there's an occupation, it should be temporary. You shouldn't, you know, mess things up for the people you're occupying. You don't transfer your people there. You don't take your res their resources out. You know, you keep things as intact as you can until they get their territory back. Um, now, you know, how long has it been since 67? You know, we are, it, it's, there's no sign that the Israeli government is moving toward, toward changing the, the situation of occupation. And which is why we said, we, you know, it's no longer sufficient for us to analyze this in this kind of extraordinary body of law having to do with, you know, the unusual temporary circumstance of an occupation, this is what we're stuck with. So let's analyze it under the more ordinary human rights law and see, you know, does Israel live up to that? And they don't. Thank you so much for that. Um, now, now I wanna to turn to international law, international courts, the United Nations. There, there seems to be a process that, that is very clear, but there are also politics, international politics, geopolitics mm -hmm. involved. Can you help us navigate that in terms of how we as Americans can be a, play a constructive role in moving the process of achieving uh, international adherence to international law uh, on this issue? Okay, well, let me, um, Salam, let me answer that in two parts. Let me talk about the United Nations Human Rights Council mm -hmm. and then the International Criminal Court because those I think are the two most important for right now. Maybe I'll add a word about the UN Security Council too. Um, the, at the UN Human Rights Council, um, you may recall that Trump withdrew US membership from the council. You know, Nikki Haley was the US ambassador at the time in New York. And um, their line was the Human Rights Council is prejudiced against Israel, we're pulling out. And the reason they cited was that, first of all, there are a lot of resolutions on the occupied territories, but there's also a sort of special agenda item devoted exclusively to the occupied territories. And no other situation has a special agenda item like that. And you know, our answer on this was, you know, yeah, there are a lot of resolutions on, on, um, on Israel and Palestine. Um, we'd be very happy to have one consolidated resolution um, you know, if you don't like this special agenda item, introduce that consolidated resolution someplace else in an ordinary agenda item. Um, but don't, you know, give Israel impunity. Don't just ignore the problem. And, and you know, our view is the test of um, whether this is a legitimate, you know, um, you know, genuine concern or whether it's just an excuse to let Israel off the hook is whether, you know, the U.S. and its partners find some way to condemn what's happening. Um, and it can be in one resolution, it doesn't have to be in a bunch. It can be in any agenda item they choose. But, you know, that's not what they tend to do. They tend to oppose the resolution, abstain. You know, so they're, um, and, and I mean, Biden, to his credit, is now going to re-engage with the council. He's going to run, the U.S. is going to run for a seat in October. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I think they have a good chance of winning. But that's, you know, a real test of credibility. It's, you know, not just to 
to, to protect Israel, but you know, fine, treat it fairly within the Human Rights Council. Now, one thing that people also note is that the, the reason the Human Rights Council tends to be a bit more focused on Israel than maybe for other countries is because the UN Security Council has been utterly unreachable because of the US veto. Now, there is no veto in the Human Rights Council in Geneva. So it's just, you know, everybody gets one vote who's a member. But with the Security Council, the five permanent members, you know, US, China, Russia, France, UK, each get a veto. And the US almost always uses its veto to block any criticism of Israel. The one exception to this in recent times was at the end of the Obama administration. Um, and you know, Trump had already won. Um, and Obama in that, de that December um, abstained on a resolution that was critical of the settlements. And, but that was you know, fine, great. You know, so the, it passed, this, the resolution passed. We'd like to see Biden do something similar. Um, but he's, in his approach to Israel has been, you know, has been weak so far. It, it, you know, if you look at sort of for the recent fighting in Gaza, um, he was very reluctant to criticize any Israeli conduct. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I recognize that he's still kind of, you know, getting his balance. He's trying to figure out what his position is, but, but so far there hasn't been a real sign that Biden is willing to take on Israeli abuses. Um, the one thing I could, should say is that their response to our report, it was, um, they, you know, they, they said, you know, apartheid is not a term that we use, but they didn't say you're wrong, you know, you're, you're, you condemn what you said, you know, it was, it was a pretty mild given the US government. So we were actually pleased with that. Now, Salam, let me just go to another part of your question, which is the International Criminal Court. Um, and this is, you know, of course, you know, like a global war crimes tribunal. It's designed to be um, a backup, you know, a, a tribunal of last resort when national processes fail. And certainly national processes have failed in the case of Palestine. Um, I mean, not only, you know, is there no effort by Hamas to investigate or prosecute, you know, the indiscriminate rocket attacks on, on civilians in, in southern Israel, but there also is just no history of the Israeli government um, investigating or prosecuting its own war crimes, you know, whether bombing in Gaza, you know, these big apartment buildings or, you know, killing many people on, on in, you know, various parts of this recent, um, this recent conflict or, you know, or to deal with the settlements, um, which are official policy, even though they're, they're war crimes. So, um, but when the International Criminal Court prosecutor decided to open up an investigation, the Trump administration did something utterly outrageous. They imposed sanctions on the prosecutor. Now, you know, think about what that says about the rule of law. You know, we, we, we you know, rather than accept that this is an independent tribunal trying to apply the law even handedly to, you know, anybody who comes within its jurisdiction, Trump basically said, no, if you're going to look at Israel and the other thing that you said is if you're going to look at, you know, U.S. torture in Afghanistan, where they also had jurisdiction, we're going to impose sanctions on you. And they, you know, froze her bank account and made, made the prosecutor like, you know, her life miserable for a while. Now, you know, Biden, his credit, lifted those sanctions. But the Biden position is still that the International Criminal Court um, does not, should not have jurisdiction over people of a different nationality than the territory where the crime took place unless their native country has joined the court. So, you know, to, to, to put this in the U.S. example, um, they say, you know, because the U.S. has never joined the International Criminal Court, it is wrong to look at torture in Afghanistan, even though Afghanistan has joined the International Criminal Court. You know, to come back to the, my, my London analogy, it's as if, you know, somehow the British courts would not have jurisdiction over me if I murdered somebody in London because I'm not a British. You know, it's just, I mean, this is not a legal principle. This is just, you know, using power to, to, to protect yourself and your friends. Um, and it's the same you know, principle that they, they assert in the case of Palestine, they say, you know, Israel didn't join the court. Why are you going to prosecute Israelis? Well, because they're committing their crimes in Palestine and Palestine did join the court. Um, now, you know, it's worth noting that you can always avoid the international criminal court's jurisdiction if you investigate and conscientiously prosecute your own. But as I mentioned, that's not a way to describe how Hamas, the PA, or the Israeli government treats their own criminals. So, um, so I think this is you know, a, a very appropriate area for the International Criminal Court to be involved. 
Um, there's a new prosecutor now. We have to see how he does, you know, whether he picks this case up. But I, th I, I hope that this is an area where they will continue to do important work. Is there a role for non-governmental organizations, NGOs like ours? I, I know Human Rights Watch is mm -hmm. very much a specialized uh, institution uh, on international uh, law, but those who are uh, advocating for human rights in general, uh, is there a role for groups like ours? Well, I mean, yes, in the sense that, the, let's look at these three institutions. I mean, I, I would urge Biden you know, not to use the veto on Israel resolutions in the Security Council, you know, to support, you know, appropriate resolutions at the UN Human Rights Council on Israel-Palestine. And if that's a consolidated one under, you know, an ordinary agenda item, fine. But, you know, not to be opposed to everything. But to, you know, there are serious problems here. You know, pick your vehicle and, and then say something, do something. And in terms of the International Criminal Court, um, they just, you know, there's more to it than just Israel. I mean, there, this is, you know, goes back to even the Clinton administration where they felt that, you know, okay, they would tolerate this court, but they never want it to be used against Americans. And the same theory that they apply there that, you know, an American commit a crime in another country, but you can't come after us, they're using that for Israel as well. So there is a need to kind of attack that, you know, sense of impunity, that sense of entitlement. Like, you know, why should Americans be able to commit war crimes in other countries? And why can't those other countries, if their national system is not strong enough, why can't they bring in the International Criminal Court to see that justice is done? So these are all areas where I think NGO voices would be very important in pushing the Biden administration to do the right thing. You know, human rights uh, and US policy has always been a, uh, a mystery to me uh, because while our government officials have always claimed that our foreign policy is about our values. Uh, yet, when we look at democracy in various regions of the world, the United States has prevented, uh, if not actively uh, countered, uh, movements for democracy. Human rights is not really a part of US policy. Um, I just want to get your sense of where we are in terms of human rights and US policy right now. Well, you know, it's the Biden administration is a work in progress. I mean, I think we know that under Trump, he basically abandoned the pursuit of human rights. You know, he only talked about human rights for the handful of adversary governments that he hated. So, you know, Venezuela or, or China or what have you. But, you know, for the most part, he just, you know, ignored human rights. He, he embraced, you know, one autocrat after another. Now, Biden came in, you know, recognized that a huge damage has been done to US credibility. And, he and, and Blinken, the Secretary of State, said early on that human rights would be a guiding principle of US foreign policy. Now, that doesn't mean that human rights always wins, but it does mean that it, um, it's an important factor. Now, they haven't really been living up to that in the Middle East. And if you just look at you know, arms sales, they've been selling arms to, you know, to Egypt despite, you know, by far and away the worst repression in modern Egyptian history under President Sisi. You know, they've been selling arms to the Saudis and the Emiratis despite the war crimes that they were responsible for in Yemen. And they continue to send massive military aid and arms to the Israeli government without any effort uh, to use that enormous leverage to see better treatment of Palestinians. You know, for example, an end to the apartheid. So, I've been disappointed so far. And while, you know, I realize that, you know, Biden's trying to do a lot at once and he's not gonna fight every battle at once. Um, it's not tolerable for this to go on forever. You know, for the US to just continue to be supporting, you know, with military aid, with arms, these highly repressive regimes. And, and so that's, um, I think that's an area where we need to push. You know, Biden has said the right thing in the abstract at the area of principle, but when it comes to the Middle East, we're not, you know, we're not walking the talk yet. And that's something that's important that the U.S. needs to do. Uh, then when it comes to Americans, uh, there, there's a law, there are laws that are put in place that Americans cannot aid and abet terrorism overseas mm -hmm. or, or inside the United States for that matter. Mm -hmm. But to my knowledge, there are no laws. I mean, there is a law. I think there's the Leahy law. There's the U.S. Armed Export 
Control Act that prevents the United States from selling weapons that um, violate human rights and are used against civilian populations. Mm -hmm. Yet that, that is not being implemented to my knowledge, number one. And number two, as a result uh, of these human rights, uh, um, uh, um, I wouldn't say violations, but uh, uh, problems that we see, other countries use the same playbook to say, for example, the Chinese say the Uyghurs are terrorists, so therefore we have to, you know, uh, put them into this uh, uh, cultural centers. Um, what the what the Indian government in Modi is saying about Indian Muslims and Kashmiri is what what the Rohingyas are subjected to. Uh, even in Syria, what Assad said uh, about uh, the opposition that they're the terrorists. These are these are all uh, tyrannies using. Uh, the card uh, uh, of terrorism, but in, but they are actually using the playbook that the United States uh, has, and I'm not saying that the United States, that these governments are on any equal footing to the United States, but they do get their cues in, in at least from, from this standpoint, that uh, that's the playbook, that if you call somebody a terrorist, you're saying that this violates our security, then you have the right to go in and violate the human rights of these civilian populations. I mean, Salman, you're absolutely right. And this is a horrible legacy of the second Bush administration, you know, where Cheney and company really felt that, you know, I mean, there was a terrorist attack, obviously a horrible attack on 9-11, but they felt that, you know, therefore anything goes. And they instituted large scale torture. You know, we still have 39 people locked up in Guantanamo, you know, most of them without ever having been charged, um, you know, almost 20 years now. So that is a, um, a horrible legacy. Now, you know, the torture, as far as we know, stopped with the Bush administration. Obama certainly stopped it. Um, and we don't even think it revived under Trump. Um, and I don't expect it to revive under Biden. You know, I'm, I'm happy to see that Biden, you know, just transferred his first prisoner out of Guantanamo. I don't think there were any transfers under Trump. Right. So we're down to 39 prisoners, but it would certainly be good to close Guantanamo altogether because it is, you know, a, a stain on America's reputation, but it also symbolizes what you're describing, Salam, which is, you know, an abusive approach to fighting terrorism. And, you know, it, the, the damage has been done with Bush, but the U.S. can try to, you know, redeem itself, you know, both because it's the right thing to do, because, you know, just because you're fighting terrorism doesn't mean you can use anything you want. Um, that's why you have international human rights and humanitarian law to say there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. You can't torture. You can't bomb civilians. You know, you can't, you know, whatever. So there, I mean, there's a whole body of law about what you can't do and you got to live within that. So, um, but, you know, governments, of course, love to wave the terrorist banner. And then you get, you know, outrages like what China is doing in Xinjiang right now, where, you know, because there were, you know, a handful of terrorist attacks, you know, a decade ago, I guess, um, they're locking up a million Uyghur and other Turkic Muslims and basically forcing them to renounce Islam, to renounce their culture, to renounce their language. I mean, this is, you know, outrageous stuff. These are crimes against humanity, um, all you know, ostensibly in the name of fighting terrorism. So um, we have to be very careful about the use of that term and recognize that it's not carte blanche to just rip up the rules book and, and engage in whatever atrocity you want. Now, you also mentioned at the outset um, U.S. law on arms transfers, and you're absolutely right. There's the Leahy law, which is more narrow, which says you, you cannot send arms to abusive units. But there's also broader law um, in the United States, which says you cannot sell arms to governments that systematically commit gross violations of human rights. So the most severe abuses, war crimes, torture, and the like. And um, it's hard to justify the arms sales to the governments I mentioned under that law. You know, and, and I think there's, you know, a useful thing for NGOs to do is to push the Biden administration, you know, what are you doing? This law is there, it's in the books. It's not just a matter of, you know, it being the right thing to do. This is what the law requires. Why are you not abiding by it? Thank you, Ken. Uh, we have a question from Amani Ahmed. Go ahead, Amani. Hi, yeah, thank you for um, speaking to us. So I'm a law student, actually, and uh, we are hearing a lot about you know, the push to ban critical race theory in schools and possibly 
like federally funded law schools. And I, and I know this has kind of always been an issue. We learned a little bit about it in school, how they would deny professors tenure who were, um, you know, engaging in this kind of discourse. But I'm wondering, you know, it, should this be somewhat successful? Do you think that there would be a great impact on human rights law at large? Because from, you know, from the, edu from the start at your education, you're not kind of engaging in that critical education. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I hope that these efforts are simply declared unconstitutional, you know, a blatant violation of, of the First Amendment, because, um, you know, you shouldn't be legislating history. You know, the critical race theory is, you know, an interpretation of history in the United States. And, you know, whether you believe in it or not, um, it shouldn't be up to legislators to, to prohibit discussion of it. Now, you know, there is, you know, some tradition, particularly at um, you know, elementary schools and so forth, where, where, you know, curriculum is set by state officials. But I'm not aware of any effort to sort of whitewash American history, to say that, you know, ugly sides of American history can't be discussed. I mean, that just is really stepping over bounds. So I, you know, I do feel that this is, um, you know, it's an it's a effort, you know, as one often sees, to, to politicize race, to try to find, you know, a wedge issue that will upset certain constituencies and get them to vote Republican. But I think it's, you know, very important to point out the principles that are at stake here. And if you agree with critical race theory, you disagree with it, this is a matter for discussion. It's not a matter for censorship. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we have another question from Noor. Go ahead, Noor. Hi, um, I just had a question about the United States, the role. Would you say um, asking America to come in, do the job, it's not the right call? Judging by what the United States have done in the past and also being a colonial state, like if you think of like a lot of us, like me being Somali, um, I am a reason why we're here in the States because of what America have done and governing other nations. So do you think that asking the United States to step in the conflicts between Israel and Palestinians is the right things to do? Well, I should say, Noor, that I mean, nobody's asking for an invasion or anything like that. You know, it's really, you know, the U.S. is not a neutral party in the Israeli-Palestinian contest right now. It is, you know, siding 100 percent with the Israeli side to the tune of, you know, billions of dollars in military aid, um, to the tune of using its veto to, you know, to block Security Council action, um, you know, rallying support to defend Israel regardless of its abuses. So what we want is really just a, a, a more balanced, a fairer, a more principled approach to the conflict. I mean, the U.S. is exercising its cloud right now, and that cloud is, you know, is quite weighty. We'd like it to be exercised in a less partisan, less one-sided way. Uh, Noor, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do. Um, thank you for answering that question. Another question I had was like, um, would you say like what happened in South Africa is needs to happen in Israel because I do believe decolonize people their right to their land and then for them to make the call. So do you believe like decolonization on that term is a good way to go? Yeah, I mean, we've been using the terminology more of occupation than, than decolonization here, although I guess you could use both. Um, but I'm not, you know, at this point, I mean, part of what we were doing with the apartheid report is to say, let's not look at this solely as an occupation. You know, it's, um, we've been doing that for so long and getting nowhere because, you know, the answer to occupation is a peace process and the peace process is just moribund right now. So let's just accept, you know, Israel is ruling this territory for the time being. Let's insist on equal rights so long as it rules. If it wants to, you know, allow a Palestinian state to emerge, fine, that's a, that's a political process. But we're not gonna wait for that to insist on equal rights. We should have equal rights now. And so that's, you know, so kind of the point of this is not, you know, is actually to kind of break out of the colonialization framework and to look at it in terms of just how are people who live next door to each other being treated? Um, and while there is a dominant power there, the Israeli government, let's insist on equal rights for so long as they're the dominant power. And if there's, you know, significant territory where Israel is no longer in control and a Palestinian state emerges, that's, that's a different matter. But, you know, that's not something we're taking a position on. Um, we're just saying, you know, de facto power now needs to respect equal rights. Uh, in terms of uh, Americans, can uh, several Americans tried to have, uh, go to Gaza, uh, and I think even some of them to the West Bank have 
been harassed, if not prevented from entering. Is there something we could do to allow Americans, since we're giving Israel so much financial and military aid, uh, to make that a condition uh, as part of that aid? And, and I know it's a, it's a tall order, but I just want, you to, I want to get your perspective on that. Well, I mean, theoretically, yes, although to be honest, I would prioritize other conditionality, you know, such as ending apartheid. Yeah. Um, but, um, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure how difficult it is to go to the West Bank at this point. If you get into Israel, um, it's pretty easy to go to the West Bank. Um, it's much more difficult to go to Gaza. And I mean, I've been to Gaza twice, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process and you need permission. And, um, and so I'm, um, and certainly I think we would all benefit from having more visitors to Gaza. But at this point, if I were urging U.S. conditionality, I really would, you know, put more of an emphasis on Israeli abuses against Palestinians. Fair enough. Um, have you watched the movie *The Present*? Because it, I think it's a wonderful short film on the issue of uh, 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 the inability of, for Palestinians to travel. It's about a father who wants to buy a refrigerator for his for his wife. He takes his daughter, and you go through the. The, the, the hurdles, the trials and tribulations of him just getting through the checkpoints and trying to get back. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that okay. I think uh, a former CIA director suggested that all members of the US government should watch. No, look, I mean, I, I haven't seen it, but I've, I've read about it, so I'm familiar with the film. And I understand it to be a very good representation of just the extreme limitations on mobility for Palestinians who live within the West Bank. And of course, you know, we have to recognize that in many ways they're the lucky ones because they're, you know, it's even worse in Gaza. You know, I mean, in Gaza, um, it's much more difficult to get out of Gaza at all, you know. So, but this effort to kind of, you know, limit travel, you know, divide up populations. I mean, that's part of the way that Israel maintains control over the Palestinian population. Uh, there's a question from somebody who says they have a bad connection, so they want me to read it. How would you respond to the claim that the current system is necessary to ensure the Jewish character of the state? Well, I mean, I, I tried to address that um, earlier in my remarks, but the, um, I mean, obviously if, if Israel were really concerned about that, they would very quickly allow a Palestinian state to emerge because within the 1967 borders, there's a very clear Jewish majority. Um, the, International law with respect to immigration is quite deferential and does allow governments to you know, discriminate in whom they admit as immigrants. And so if Israel you know, wanted as a basic matter to prioritize admitting Jews who wanted to emigrate to Israel, they would be allowed to do that, but that does not give them license to discriminate among citizens. And so for example, the current practice where you know, a Jewish Israeli can marry somebody overseas, they get to come to the Israel, quickly become at least a permanent resident if not a citizen. But if a Palestinian you know, wants to marry somebody from the West Bank or Gaza, it's extraordinarily difficult to give them you know, residency rights within Israel. And that kind of blatant discrimination is not justifiable. You can't just say, oh, Jewish state as a justification for that. And, and the last uh, question I have for you, Ken, is a personal one. Uh, you know, we, we talk about so many figures in our country, but uh, uh, very few really, um, um, it, 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 we talk about celebrities and, and we, we, uh, we make this mistake that we associate celebrities with her heroism. Like they're heroes because they're able to dribble a, a basketball or run or, or and, it's, and it's great, it's a great uh, uh, skill to have, of course, uh, but a, a true hero is, is one who is standing for the truth um, and is not wavering. Um, and even if they're the only person, if they have that conviction and sincerity, they uphold the truth. And the Quran says, stand for the truth and justice, even and be witnesses to God, even if you have to testify against yourself uh, or your own community, uh, for that matter. So I think that that is our standard of upholding the truth and, and justice. Um, but I wanted you to talk about your personal journey in, in, in working uh, for Human Rights Watch and what lessons you can give to people who would like to, like to emulate you and, and, and follow that path, but 
they feel like there's so many hurdles to get to that point of really up, you know, working for international human rights and human rights law. Well, I should say, I mean, I think the power of Human Rights Watch and the human rights movement is that the truth really does matter. And that, um, you know, the truth forces governments to have their conduct weighed against public morality. And the reason governments go to great such lengths to hide their human rights violations is because they realize that those violations are shameful. They don't want people knowing how they're behaving. And so there's huge power in the truth. And obviously one way to do that is through an institution like Human Rights Watch, but in a sense, everybody can do it themselves through social media, through you know, whatever form you have. Um, don't be afraid of speaking the truth and you know, be as objective and principled as you can, but call out misconduct. And that's how things move. You know, when there's enough of a clamor against governmental misconduct, then the pressure is such that the government has to begin to change. Thank you so much. And uh, my guest has been Ken Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, uh, that recently issued a report April 27th, uh, 2021 of this year, a threshold crossed Israeli authorities and the crimes of apartheid and persecution. And of course, we encourage everybody to support Human Rights Watch. And hopefully, Ken, after the pandemic, we'll see you in Los Angeles or New York or Washington, and uh, we'll get to uh, work with you further and support the great work that you're doing. I look forward to that. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Ken.